Well, I'm very excited about this message. This is my Christmas message for this year, and I am, I'm really excited about it. I think probably it is the uh, longest title that I've ever given any sermon that I've ever done. The reason for Christmas is so that Jesus could destroy something. That's kind of long, I know. Maybe I should just say the reason for Christmas or Christmas is for destroying. I don't know. But anyway, that's the title. Well, I hope you'll grab your Bibles or at least uh, get ready with some notes taking ability because we're going to cover a lot of scripture. I really want you to know exactly where I'm coming from. And so we'll start with John, the third chapter, verse 17. God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That word saved, that word means sozo in the Greek. It it means to save, or past tense, saved, healed, past tense, or delivered, past tense. It's used in all of those terminologies to mean those things. So, Let's just say that together. Since it's past tense in our case, it's all happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus did all these things. So basically, 2,000 years ago, he saved, he healed, and he delivered us. Let's say that together. Saved, healed, and delivered. Yep, there you go. Christmas is the celebration of the appearing on earth of God's eternal son, Jesus Christ. And the reason that he appeared on this earth is to destroy the works of the devil. Turn over to 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And it just simply says the reason the Son of God appeared or came or was born into this earth, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came literally to destroy something. And let me just kind of peg you with this. But unless we welcome Jesus as the destroyer in our life, we can't really ever have him as the savior of our life. The savior, the sozo. Hebrews 7.25 says that you are saved, sozoed to the uttermost. Saved healed, delivered to the uttermost. That's important. That's pretty big big news right there. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Mark 2 verse 17 tells us that. Jesus saves by destroying. A surgeon cuts out or destroys cancer's tissue in a, in a set of lungs. Or he'll come along and he'll amputate a foot that might be full of gangrene or something that's going to destroy the person in order to bring healing to the body. And Jesus, in the same way, came to cut out or do away with, to destroy something that is destroying us. The works of sin and death, the works of the devil in this earth. Turn over with me to Isaiah 61. We'll look at verse 1 through about 3. Isaiah was a prophet 2,000 years before Jesus came. And Isaiah 53 gave us one of the better pictures of who Jesus is than in all of the Bible. But here in in 61, it also gives us a good picture of things that, of what he did. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. You know, in a lot of headers, it says the good news of salvation for this particular verse. Verse 61 just says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound. Verse 2 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, over in Luke chapter 4, Verse 18 and 19, Jesus himself, while he was at Nazareth preaching in his own hometown, quoted this particular portion of Scripture. And at the end of it, he closed the books and he said, Today, this Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm it. He was telling them, I'm the me. The Spirit of the Lord is God is upon me. He has anointed me. I'm the me. 
Yeah, in, in your own hometown, that's difficult. <laughs> anyway, that that's not all he said. I'm going to go on and read the remaining part here that I want to get to. Verse 2 again, to proclaim the acceptable year of the of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And now I want you to really pay attention to this next part. It's it's just real powerful. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Wow. I think that's just so impressive to me. Jesus was sent to destroy something. And he was also sent to be sown as a seed to die so that we could multiply his work and reproduce in abundance, be sown as his seed. We are, you see, his seed. Trees of righteousness is what we grow up to be. Now, over in Luke chapter 6, verse 43 through 45 just says for the good for a good tree does not bear bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit for every tree is known by its own fruit for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks now in hebrew 13:15 talks about the fruit of our lips being as being praise and uh, the ability that we have to glorify him Our words are seed. Our words are very powerful. With that in mind, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through about 6. It talks about, for the weapons of our warfare, verse 4, are not carnal. They're not fleshly. But they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, verse 6, and being ready to punish all disobedience. When your, when your obedience is fulfilled, in other words, when you become mature, you'll be able to punish these disobedient thoughts that you have, uh, disobedient activities that you see. So what did Jesus come to do? To destroy the works of the devil, right? All right. Well, First John, turn over with me to First John th- chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Beloved, you are children of God. And it goes on to say, we shall be like him. (laughs) He came to do what? Yeah, destroy the works of the devil. That's correct. And we're going to be like him. We do what he does. We're going to be similar to his. Are you a son? Sure. You're a son or a daughter of the Most High. That's who you are. So what did you appear on this earth to do? Jesus knew because he read Isaiah 61. Guess what? We can read Isaiah 61 as well. Did God equip us to do what he's called us to do? Hey, I have a script for that. Not an app, but a script. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17. And it just simply says, as he is, you know, he still is. He's not gone away. You know, he's up there sitting with the Father in heaven. That's, That's awesome. But as he is... So are we in this world. While we're here and he's sitting up there, we're like him. As he is, so are we in this world. Are we equipped? Absolutely. Well, did Emmanuel, or God with us, Jesus, go to be with the Father and send the Holy Spirit, God in us, to empower us to do even greater works, Jesus said, than he did? Yes, he did. Yes, we can. (laughs) Okay, well, let's consider what God gave Jesus in Isaiah 61 and what he has given us for today. Yet, consider this, we have even a better covenant to operate in than Jesus had. That'll pop your bubble if you just really think about it for a little bit because, you see, he fulfilled the old covenant. He had to operate in the old covenant. He had to fulfill it. Even though he was the new covenant, he didn't get to operate in that. He had to operate and fulfill the old covenant to the T. 
So what do we have? Well, let's just kind of talk about that for a few minutes. We are sons, right? Therefore, we have three very powerful things to start with. One, we have his robe of righteousness. Two, we have his ring, his authority, or the family credit card to operate out of. And three, we have shoes, which indicates grace and freedom. A son, not a slave. We get that from the prodigal son story in Luke 15, 11 through 32. We are righteous. We have authority. And we are free and free indeed. So what else do we have? Well, let's go over to Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. It says that he called the 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all devils or demons. How many? Over all, all the demons. And to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, wait a minute. Wow. Whoa. Look at that. He gave them the ability to cure diseases. And then later on, it says he gave them the ability to heal the sick. Can you be sick without disease? Sure you can. You can have a sick soul, can't you? Our mind, will, and emotion can be very sick and very messed up. And yet we don't have a disease in our life. It might produce some later on if we allow it to stay that way. But yes, Yes, he gave them authority over both of those rams. One chapter on down the road, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. He appointed this 70 others, it says. 70 others, not the 12, but 70 more people. Verse 9 says that they went out and they he commanded them to heal the sick that was there, wherever they wound up. And he said to them the same thing that he said to the 12, the kingdom of God, preach the kingdom of God. Tell them that the kingdom of God has come near you. And in verse 17, it says that the 70 return after they'd been out for a while with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So he gave them everything that he gave the 12, right? I mean, they had the authority, they had the power to heal, they had all of those good things things. And then, my friends, come to the chapter, the, the second chapter of Acts, where the 120 was waiting for something, and Peter quotes Joel chapter 2, verse 28, in Acts 2, 17. So, it says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And that's exactly what happened in Acts 2.17 and the rest of that chapter. So God in us is better than God with us. In other words, the promise of the Holy Spirit had come and God is now in us and operating. He's not just walking on earth so that we can be that he's among us, but now he is within us inhabiting us. Wow. Well, listen, if that weren't enough, we also have been given the Word of God, both the Logos and the Ramos. You know, the Logos is written down on paper, and now we have them in computers and all kinds of places. We have no lack of being able to access the Logos Word of God. And we also have no limit, really, in accessing the rhema or the heart of God because it was the, the scripture that was written was written into our hearts. When we read something that's right, we know it's right. When we read something that is wrong, we know it's wrong. When we encounter things, the, the rhema word of God touches our heart and reveals the true opinion of of God that's operating it. Hey, if that wasn't enough, I mean, we have the Old Testament, the New Testament. We have all of this stuff written down and not only on paper, but in our heart. That is awesome. If that weren't enough, we also read in that word of God that the gifts of the Spirit are given to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 11, is one of the places that is listed. These gifts are given without price. It doesn't cost us anything. God just wants to bless us, but he does it for a reason. And in, in that scripture, at the end of it, it just says, to profit all. Those gifts are given to us, to the profit of all of us. So if I'm given a gift, any one of those gifts that's listed, 
and I won't go into that because of the time for the sake of time, but any one of those gifts that are list, listed there in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through, through 11 is designed for me to be able to profit use in some way or others, to profit everybody because that gift is flowing and operating through me in a powerful way. That's pretty cool. That's a good gift, I'd say. And not only that, but we can also refer to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, which gives us another list. And this list is called the fruit of the Spirit. This is something that's grown. It's matured. It's character that causes us to be like Him. You know, if we're going to operate and be like Him, if we can do all things like him, if we're able to be like him, we're going to represent some of those fruits of the Spirit. And it says there's no law against them. That's pretty cool. During the 70s, and, you know, we, we, we were very active in the church. And, and there's tons of book if you just uh, want to find out about spiritual warfare. Now, our warfare, it says, is not carnal. So this it's spiritual warfare. It's not warfare. A lot of times I'm afraid that some of the people push that over into where they get it into almost a carnal realm. You got to do this and we've got to do that. And if you don't know the names of all these demons, well, you can't do. It just goes on and on and on and on. Well, I want to give you a better picture maybe than what you have of what spiritual gifts can do and are. And let me use this example I think it's very apropos for for explaining or giving you a mental picture of what spiritual gifts are all about. All of these things that I just talked about have been given to us. The word, authority, the gifts, the fruit, everything has been given over to us by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, to empower and equip us. And here's the example I'd like to give you. How many of you know what a judo expert is or what the art of judo? It's an Eastern religion deal, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving it as an example. The whole principle of judo is a self-defense mechanism that uses the force of the opponent against them. So when this enemy comes and tries to attack you, you lean into it and just toss it over to another location. Uh, You take all of the force that was designed to be used against you and you turn it against the one that's coming against you. That is such a good picture because when the enemy comes against you, you just put the move on him. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7, hey, upon who? You cast your cares where? Upon him. What a deal. You know, when you do that, everything that comes against you lands right at the feet of Jesus. And your opposition is helpless and defeated before him because he is much mightier than they are. Victory is sure. And the destruction of the lie and the work of the devil is done. He takes care of it for us. It's not that we that we have to deal with it. We simply cast those cares upon him. What a great weapon. By using the weapons that we have been given, we have such a nice gift. You know, I was thinking about Christmas, and it's like, wow, that's not just a few gifts. That's a whole bunch of gifts. That's like a big Christmas. (laughs) I love it. So, Merry Christmas. Let me just visualize one more thing. What if we were all sitting around in our pajamas and and ready to open all the packages under the tree and we're just opening presents and, oh my gosh, this is such a great gift. I I just always wanted the gift of faith. This is exactly what I want. Thank you for such a wonderful gift. You know, I knew God was going to give you that gift because you are always preaching and teaching. You're a teacher. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful gift you got. I mean, what if we were all sitting around admiring each other's gifts and just being so excited about what God God has given to us. Merry Christmas. The Prince of Peace is established on this earth, and you are so blessed. God in us. <laughs> now, as usual, I always try to bring some kind of inspiration, a little bit of information 
But I also want to give you an impartation. And this year, I certainly hope that you will celebrate his coming, but be a little bit more aware of the real reason for the season. Sozo, saved, healed, and delivered from the works of the devil. And you're empowered to go and save, heal, and deliver others through the authority that, and gifts that you've been given. God in us, the hope of glory, and the destroyer of the works of the devil. Amen? Well, my friends, I hope that blessed you. I hope you get a little bit different picture, and I hope that you'll be encouraged by the Word of God. Have a wholesome, blessed, and wonderful Christmas, but be ready to use your gifts because God's going to bring opportunity before you. People in this world need to know the good news. They need to have healing. They have to have a Savior, and they definitely need deliverance in their life so that those things that held them captive will no longer be able to hold them. Have a great Christmas, wonderful New Year, and be blessed, my friend. This is Fred Hughes. I hope you will find our website and listen in to these. We have a podcast. We have articles that are at the website and some teaching and things. Go to www.decision, D-E-C-I-S-I-O-N, and then the numeral 1.org.